Hey everyone, Kerr the Artist here, and welcome back to another Ben 10 Breakdown. While I did plan to get both parts of the finale out in one go, I ended up having to make some changes, but based on this poll, I'm releasing part 1 today and part 2 next week. Now, I did have a topic of discussion for this finale, but I want to save that for part 2. So for now, I want to take this opportunity to say goodbye to the UAF era and celebrate the footprint that it left on the franchise. As I've always said, the trio of Ben, Gwen, and Kevin seemed like the most iconic group of heroes in the franchise. And while I'll always have a soft spot for Max and the kids, and I'm a big fan of Rook, which we'll get to the OV breakdowns, there's always been an imbalance of dynamics with both of those groups. The trio felt like they were all equals. Each of them had their own strengths that they brought to the team, and while they butt heads many times, they always brought out the best in each other. We got plenty of scenes of them together just casually hanging out, and what their personal lives are like, such as their homes, activities, and eventually how they deal with Ben's fame. We saw the growth from keeping Kevin at arm's reach to him becoming becoming a part of the family. While Kevin joined the team pretty quickly, it took a long time for his character to catch up and evolve into the responsible, caring, supportive, and selfless hero that easily makes him a fan favorite. Gwen struggles with both her powers and her greater identity between alien ancestry and learning more spells, whereas now she's the most capable member of the team and the most powerful being in her world. And Ben, well, like I said, I do have a topic of discussion for next week, but let's just say I really love the journey he goes through UAF as a whole. The pair of shows have many fans, many haters, and has birthed a ton of diverse discussion about its stories. But deep down, I'm sure that every Ben 10 fan can see what a true legacy these series has left behind. If you're on Twitter, I'd love to hear all of your thoughts on the UAF era too. Please tag It's the Ink Tank and use the hashtag Ben 10. And from the UAF era, post your favorite screenshots, tell me your favorite episodes or favorite stories of watching the episodes, and even feel free free to share some fan art. Let's see if we can get something trending. But on the other hand, if this is your first breakdown and you're curious about how my rating system works, there's a detailed description down below along with a link to all my previous breakdowns. But by all means, watch this video first, I'm sure you'll still enjoy it. And now, let's get to the breakdown. The Ultimate Enemy Part 1 was penned by Matt Wayne and released on March 24th, 2012. After transforming the entire world into his esoterica army, George and Ben fight against Vilcubra to stop him from finally releasing the Dagon from the seal. So now we're picking right back up into the war, which we left off in the last episode, the beginning of the end. But it looks like the herd has been thinned out a little bit. War has been going on. Yeah, there's much less people around than there was last time. Although even if they get defeated or die, we should still be seeing them lying around on the ground and stuff. So pretty interesting to see the inverted shape of the lightning. We're now back to the hard and straight lines, which I actually like a little bit better. I think it looks more otherworldly when it's just a hard cut. <laughs> reaches over and grabs this plumber rifle. Well, I'm assuming it's a plumber rifle because it's green, but we do first see it with the Forever Knights, and we haven't ever seen it before. Here's a better look at it. This was added to the show to promote this, like, transforming plumber rifle suitcase toy that they had at the time. They were trying to market it pretty hard at the last minute, too. Kevin was even holding it on the poster for this finale. But, like, this late in the show, especially with Omniverse right around the corner, it's kind of hard to try to make this appear to be some sort of staple of the show, especially because it doesn't really function any differently than the other rifles. In fact, if they wanted to introduce it earlier, I'm surprised they didn't have this be the thing that Kevin was using in the Eggman cometh. I do like this little curve when the energy shoots out. And Gwen and Kevin are still at the electronic catapult where we last left them. So either they've just been chilling around here this whole time, or this takes place simultaneously when Heat Blast and George were confronting the Vilcubra. Kevin seems to have armored up since then though. How convenient. I know pretty much every single show does this, and I know why they do it, but I'm always still a little miffed when people just reach behind themselves and magically pull out objects. Kevin plugs his plumber badge into it. I'm not sure if it full-on upgrades the gun, but maybe gives him better command over it or something. Not really sure what it does, but now it looks much more like the toy. But the green highlights that fill up these lines are... a little rigid. It's just a little bit funky. Yeah, now it shoots green. What do y'all think that did? Gwen's energy shields have the corners cut off. Kind of like this look for it. Oh, wow. Two of them are not even colored in. Look at that, they're transparent. Okay, those thuds are probably the sound of Vilgax breaking open the seal.
So this was happening simultaneously as the last couple minutes of the episode. So we've rewound time a little bit in a narrative standpoint. And there we are. Just regular purple spheres to downgrade from his lightning. Ooh, Vilgax does the dimensional shift. That's actually pretty cool to see him do that. And Heat Blast's fire stream is so strong, it's digging into the ground as it's spraying across. The dragon comes! Maybe they're perfect circles because it's such densely concentrated energy compared to the more loosely electrical looking flowing energy the Esoterica use. This reminds me of like a flash game or something where you just spam the attack the whole time. In fact, Ben 10's had a few games that's pretty much just this. Vilgax must be learning from the CN Arcade. If you break the seal, you will taste my soul! Gwen and Kevin got here pretty fast. They had to launch Ben through a catapult just to get here. I thought Vilgax was dead. Alright, that confirms it. They really did think he was dead, so that was a plot point in the show. I guess that just went over my head and I personally forgot, so my bad. I always love seeing how they handle walking out of the fire animations. They always do it kind of differently every time, but this one looks really good. Comes out as a silhouette and tears straight through the fire. Also reminiscent of the shot where the little Cooper did it to George. The moment is at hand. <laughs> You rarely ever see like a Forever Knight's real face unless they're a main character. Even that one guy at his house was wearing his helmet when he was in his boxers. All right, so this is what I've been talking about for the past couple of breakdowns, where some of them are like transformed into Esoterica, as if it's like altering their body, as opposed to just putting on the robes and willingly following them. But even so, like this isn't just mind controlling them like Winston, this is changing their body shape. He's a completely different person now. Oh my god, actual civilians on the street. So Vilcubra is turning everybody in the world into Esoterica. I remember this happened, but I didn't realize it happened like right off the bat. Well, I guess this is part two of the three-part finale, but only the last two episodes are actually called like the ultimate enemy part one and part two, but the beginning of the end is kind of like the unofficial first part of the finale. But if you were just to watch the last two, yeah, I'm surprised that this happened so early in the story. <laughs> Even Jimmy. See, Jimmy transforms from a kid straight to an adult, and his mom goes from, like, a moderate shape into this big buff dude. Maybe they transform you into this figure because it's, like, what could be considered, like, peak physical condition or something like that. So Dagon wants all of his warriors to be, like, very strong and athletic. And, you know, it's definitely easier on the animators if they all look the same, and then they can get away with all the CG doubles. But it's still, I don't know, it's still weird to me that, like, they transform into the Esoterica. It kind of takes away from, like, the persuasive brainwashing aspect that the Flamekeeper Circle was initially doing. Because now it's like literally supernatural brainwashing where they don't have a choice. They're not just being convinced and manipulated. Huh? They're using all the model sheets for the crowd again, which is what they did in Duped. Except this time, they fortunately didn't put Ben in the crowd. <laughs> Ship is sniffing. Well, after him being able to lick Julie, I guess it's fine. <laughs> Maybe he's just imitating this behavior, like, since Julie and the trio treat him like a dog, even though he technically isn't, maybe Ship's, like, trying to adapt to those habits. What are you? Very useful that he's able to detect that happening, too. Similar to how he was able to detect that Elena was posing as Julie. But they've been skipping over the transformations for the ship armor lately. Last time in Night of the Living Nightmare, it happened off screen. Julie? It's very elaborate to animate, so if it's not important, why waste the time? But as a big fan of transformations and morph animations, I take it as a loss. But well, this was always weird too. It hits this girl first, and then everybody else. Makes it more dramatic, but also doesn't really make much sense. Yay, ship. Get her out of there. The whole world? Oh, snap. <laughs> Hey, let's get on for the- Am I 
safe. I like the effort for all these around the world shots. I feel like this is the most we've ever seen background characters in the show. Now all beings on Earth serve him. I get that Gwen's mana would protect them from the Dagon. They've kind of established that that seems possible, but not too sure about how Ship is able to resist it. I don't really buy that, but I guess it's vague enough where you can assume that it just somehow works. Like, oh yeah, Ship's armor protected her because it probably just can. There's billions of lives that I can't sense anymore. Now, that's interesting for two reasons. For one, that means Gwen can sense billions of lives to be begin with, which I feel like is a pretty noteworthy feat. It really shows how far her tracking ability is gone. And for two, the Esoterica that are transformed don't have life signs, so I wouldn't say that the people inside of the Esoterica are dead, but it does make you really question, like, how far did the transformation into the Esoterica go? Your physical body changes, your mind completely changes, and you have no signs of life. Every living person on Earth has been transformed into an Esoterica. This little 360 right here, very smoothly animated. When it's really fast, it makes the textures look very wiggly, but that's something that's so hard to be consistent on a moving shot. Behold the true power of the dagger. I might be reading into this though, but I feel like this is implying that because there's more Esoterica, Vilgax is now more powerful. Maybe he feeds off of the life force of the transformed people of the planet, making him stronger, and their hollow shells are turned into the Esoterica. I don't know though, I, I don't think there's a real answer. <laughs> Gwen's really carrying the team right now. She shielded them from transforming and is blocking off Vilgax's giant Odama Rasengan. It's shrinking as it gets harder for Gwen to resist. Perhaps the energy really is just becoming more and more dense. So this upcoming shot of Heat Blast right here is actually reused from a few minutes ago. Yeah, right here, when he first shoots at Vilgax. Now he's shooting fire at Vilgax's feet to melt the ground. It actually pulls this move pretty often, or at least often enough for me to notice it's something that he relies on. <laughs> In fact, why even transform back? But if you look at the rock when Heat Blast jumps off of it, it turns from red to the regular stone, sort of emphasizing his terraformation powers. And you can see Heat Blast is a black silhouette when he's transforming back. You can still see his big fists and his feet, see where the his bird looking holes are. In fact, the bubbles themselves, we don't see a lot anymore. Usually it is just a stone cold flash. You got zero leverage in there. It's kind of lame though. He can't dig himself out the ground. Put this back on. Away with it. Kevin's arm is layered in front of him when it should be behind, but then snaps behind once George smacks away the helmet. That just makes George's mind resistance even more confusing to me. It's either his own mind's capability, the power of the helmet, or the power of the sword. No matter how it works though, George can't be mind controlled. I'm on it. A spell to hold the dagger. Cause she's just that powerful now. Although now they're leaving, so they kind of just showed up here to shield George and Ben and then dip. Which, I mean, I guess, yeah, that's useful, but they were making it seem like this seal was pretty hard to get to last episode, so that's a lot of work to come out here just to leave. Master, grant your humble and obedient vessel even more power! I don't care if it's an act or not, I don't like seeing Vilgax like this. Not even in a sense that, like... I feel like it degrades his character, because let's face it, Vilgax just isn't really a character anymore, period. But it's just not interesting or enjoyable to me. Like, what What do you guys feel about uh, Vilgax trying to pretend to be loyal to Dagon in order to get power? So, like, when I phrase it like that, I feel like it's an interesting concept and a good idea on Vilgax's part, but, like, I don't know, when I'm seeing it happen, it's hard to enjoy. So the earth. Like, look at this man. He's so helpless and pathetic now. I miss you, cyborg Vilgax. Respect. I command it even here. Underestimating me is a great mistake. Vilgax owes allegiance to no one. Got me thinking about AF Vilgax, like perhaps I treated you too harshly. Although he is crazy powerful, though. I'll give him that. And whenever he glows, that looks awesome, too. Order! Wow, the cave is gigantic in this shot now. It has never been this wide before. Just who we wanted to see, right? Now, Edel is pretty strong if he's able to just rip into the ground like this, but I might have said this before, but it really does feel like every single one of Ben's aliens has super strength on some level. Yeah, just headbutt him into a wall. One thing I do strangely like about UA Edel, the top half of his head turns, but not the bottom. And there's even a sound effect for it. There's not much you can do with UA Edel, but this little action of his I do like. <laughs> The energy is actually physical and is able to be pushed and stretched. I don't know if that's because of the kind of energy this is or because of Vilkubra's capabilities. Now he grabs onto that beam. I doubt if he were human flesh and bone, he would be able to do this. 
That's neat. See in the cave from this side, and we see the dimensional rift. Now the fight's getting taken into Dagon's dimension. Be funny if this was like the Washington Monument from three different universes that he conquered, and he just collects them. But now we're here in Dagon's world. It looks very similar to a uh, Charmcaster's castle in Ledger Domain, which I guess makes sense because they're sort of connected through like being magical beings. Big textured green looking sky. I don't, I don't mind this design. I, I wouldn't even say this looks bland. Some thought put into this architecture to make it look unique and alien, but I don't know. I, I don't really vibe with it. Maybe it should have been more red and gold to match the esoterica. I was like some Flamekeeper Circle logos everywhere. Unless that's strictly like an earth thing. Maybe Dagon doesn't even care about the Flamekeeper Circle as like an organization and branding and that's just what the humans came up with to worship him. But then again, he does use Vilgax to turn the whole world into them with their uniforms and stuff, so I wonder what the level of care Dagon has towards his followers in terms of them maintaining an organized religion rather than blindly following him. Like, does he really care that they have uniforms and stuff and logos and all of that? I don't know. What has happened up there? He doesn't know, but they're in Dagon's dimension now. He should be here. I speak for my master. That is pretty crazy though. Vilgax has never had that kind of strength before. Or at least it hasn't been displayed so grandiose. He did go toe to toe with full sized Humongosaur. Who could probably reasonably do that. But this is a great visual representation of Vilkubra's strength. Another small instance where the background doesn't quite reach the end of the screen. You can see the animation overlay into it. Hey, the wheels didn't rotate out like last time. I remember being impressed with that. Makes me feel like they, they hand animate stuff like that every single time, like from the ground up, rather than having a collection of pre-done animations that they just plug in when needed. How do y'all feel about this plumber rifle? Like, do you think this is a cool design? I just, I kind of just don't care about it. Like, I might be reading too much into this, but also no, because it has a toy and it was on the poster, but it really seems like they're trying to get you to not care about the rifle, just like really recognize it as something part of the show. But it's just so late in the game, like, it just seems weird. Also, random fact, but I think somebody says, like, babies can't be turned into esoterica. Probably just to say, like, you know, no children were harmed during the Dagon takeover or whatever. I also think that's kind of worse, because that means a bunch of babies are just randomly abandoned all around the world. All right, so I actually wanted to look into that. I went on the wiki, and while it is stated there, there is no source. And I thought I remembered there being a source, so I asked around. Turns out there isn't a source. It's something that the wiki assumed was true based on this scene. <laughs> you don't see an esoterica climb out but i do have my own disagreements with that for one the two previous scenes every time the esoterica is transformed you get a reaction shot of them being transformed but in this one you don't it just cuts straight to the dagon seal So you don't actually see if the child does or does not get transformed into the Esoterica. And because that's a pretty large crib, and I also don't see any reason why it wouldn't be, we've already seen like Jimmy and his mom morph into Esotericas. I believe a baby could do that as well. But I mean, I don't work on the wiki team, so believe whatever you want. But what do you think? Let me know down below. Not sure if I like that there's no background music through this whole scene. I feel like it's to make it seem creepier and more suspenseful. But I also kind of want to see what would happen if I did throw in like suspenseful music. What do you got for me, Epidemic Sound? Kind of fits, you know, even just some light strings in there makes all the difference. Maybe everybody in town took off once they got turned into esotericas. Oh snap, I forgot to take the music back out. Maybe everybody in town took off once they got turned into esotericas. Now it's so quiet. I do like the music list parts of UA. Sometimes there definitely could be music though, so I'm not trying to say it always needs music, but this scene maybe could have used a little bit more. Although they, they do have this music cue, but... 
Eh. This is a ton of esoterica, though. I could be shooting your mom. Grandpa Max. Under the circumstances, Grandpa Max wouldn't want us to go easy. Just so we're on the same page. You know something? This is exactly what I wanted them to do with the DNA aliens. If y'all were around for the Alien Force breakdowns, you probably know pretty well by now how much I dislike that they know the DNA aliens are humans and still just, like, rigorously beat the shit out of them without remorse. Like, at bare minimum, I just wanted them to acknowledge, like, they have no other choice and this is just how it is. And they do that right here with the esoterica. And I think that's important. That that's all you you just need a small little line to be like we know what it is we know the whole world's been transformed we know we might be harming people we care about but there's nothing we can do the literal entire world is against them right now i also want to point out that i love that kevin also calls him grandpa max like he's truly a part of the family <laughs> They're running from his lasers. Is this plumber rifle really that big of a deal? I love the way the impacts are done though, and the way that they disperse. <laughs> but with the rifle, Kevin's fast enough to react to Gwen's instructions now. Before he couldn't keep up when he was fighting hand to hand, but now all he has to do is point and shoot. I can sense his mana. He's back to your left. <laughs> no, 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 behind you. <laughs> On your left. Although the esoterica are still slightly faster than the rifle, but they can get hit by it. <laughs> Wow, that's a very strong shield. Sometimes characters can just punch her shield and they'll break, but now like an army of esoterica are shooting their energy at it and it's holding up. Gwen's starting to feel really OP in this episode and I like it because she should be. Now this finale, this is the last chance they get. Man, I'm getting sick of seeing this though. Humbly begs your forgiveness, master. He's the dragon's paw. His doom is assured. Yeah, you'd think. <laughs> Ooh, we got the sword shooting out blue fire. That's different from the lightning and energy it usually shoots. This is pretty cool. I also love that Edel's lasers are like kind of translucent. Like you can see things behind them. In fact, because of the way it's interacting with the darker colors and the glow of the flames right here, I believe they're using a blend mode that's similar to like linear light or vivid light in Photoshop. She's got speed reading. Here, you can see that picture of Grandpa Max she's got hanging up again. No Dagon Buster spell yet? Nothing strong enough to cast across dimensions. The issue is her finding the right spell, not her own capability. She's like, yeah, if I find a spell you can cast across dimensions, then I can pull it off. Like, she's so freaking powerful. Back at it again with a third side tangent of the video. I do want to note that Gwen has casted spells across dimensions, most notably in Voided. She did do that Lacubra spell too, whatever that was. So it's less that, like, even casting across the dimensions is the issue. It's like, like having a spell that's powerful enough to stop the Dagon across dimensions, which is like two avenues. And as we'll see later on in the episode, she never ends up finding one. What about those books Charmcaster left behind? See, that line sounds like it's supposed to be a reference to something that happened previously, but we've literally never seen that. If anything, Hex's library, sure, but they're making it sound like Charmcaster had a collection of books that was left behind that the trio took, or at least are aware of in a previous episode. And that just like, that never happened. So statements like that, I feel, is why sometimes it's okay for me to give a lower important score on things because a lot of stuff in Ben 10 just happens off screen and they just pretend like it was a whole thing this entire time. Also like the Magister and Mr. Bauman that like all of a sudden knew the trio this entire time but only just showed up recently. Going back to a point from long ago, I still really do hold by the fact that I really don't think it's important for you to see that Gwen got Charmcaster's spellbook in a change of face. Like that's probably my, my go-to example for something that does have an origin but it's not necessary to see that to understand what happens later in the future because they do mention that Gwen got it from Charmcaster and you could just assume that it happened off screen and you know various other things in the show told you you should have snagged them all what's that a hat crazy funky junky hat I'm improvising your protection spell won't hold forever so now it's got all of these different attachments new nozzle whatever this is ammo scope something I don't know which was also a feature of the toy you'd be able to like take it apart and interchange pieces of it and such and they're bringing in reinforcement why not there's six billion of them now a reference to at the time six billion being the total population of the planet and this came out when 2012 right now it's 2023 11 years later and we have 8 billion people on the planet so in the past decade we've gone up 2 billion people that is insane <laughs> flickering crack effect again i love whenever it does it this way <laughs> look at this flying kick she does with a bunch of books under her arms straight skill on your six all right, since upgrading the rifle, Kevin's now able to shoot fast enough before they disappear. Ah! 
Oh, right. I hear and obey, oh great Dagon. Gwen's connection to the Dagon, I always forget about this. Honestly, one of my favorite twists of the arc. I don't know if you'd really call it a twist or not, though. Like, there was no real deception. It's just something I didn't think would be as relevant as it continues to be. This is the second time he's reestablished that connection, so. Gwen getting jumped by that Lacubra a dozen episodes ago? Snowballs into Gwen being the key to releasing Dagon. The monster we sent back through the seal a few months ago. A few months ago? Solitary alignment was already two weeks ago. So the third season is probably about two or three months or so. And I think I remember saying the same thing about the last two seasons as well. Like, so Ultimate Alien is like at least half a year long, maybe. And then an Omniverse Ben continues to be 16. I, I gotta save that. Future point foreshadowing now. Ben should have been 17 in Omniverse. <laughs> this is like funny and creepy at the same time. <laughs> In fact, the fact that it's kind of funny makes it more creepy in a way. Like, if that makes sense. <laughs> this is a pretty awesome shot, seeing all the esoterica kneel down with, like, a possessed, crazy-looking Gwen. The moon's glowing in the background. Actually, why is the moon glowing? UAF usually always reuses the same moon, no matter what. And this is a different moon. She got that super speed now. Runs by and sucks all the life out of these trees. We don't see her draw mana from around her that often. The last notable time I can remember was when she was drawing the mana off of the hybrid in War of the Worlds Part 2. That was like three or four seasons ago. Did she do it since then? I feel like she might have, but I can't remember. I gotta take this off. The pressure of my headphones pushing the tinfoil hat on my head gave me like a small headache. Maybe Dagon really is trying to get in here. It'll have to do. Is that her mom's car? Yeah, it is. Adelie's not gonna be happy about this. Oh, this is a really good shot that like disappears in seconds. You got all these plants, all these crashed cars, pretty neat looking city shot, and it pans down almost immediately. I do like that Gwen runs in like this weird position though, like with her arms out and her hands glowing. It's like just strange enough to be fascinating. Gwen! Everything in the car is shaking but the plumber rifle. Gwen! The Dagon is master! I wonder if uh, John and Ashley recorded those lines at the same time or like if one of them had to voice match the other. Oh, here it looks like her blur streak was actually drawn. Oh yeah, this is happening. You're outnumbered! Weird how like the main point of the story is the least interesting part of the episode so far. I is that just me? That might just be me though. If you're really Bill Gag, you're not serving anybody but yourself. Liar! He's like, don't blow my cover. <laughs> this is a great animation, especially how the lighting changes with him, wraps around him in all the right ways. I'm going to make you eat those words. He's already eaten everything else. Look at him smirking his own joke. Yes, very clever, George. You got the battle banter down. Ooh, three balls this time. This is the only attack that Vilgax knows how to spam. There we go. Okay, that's... That's different. He splits the ball into energy beams. I don't like that you can see where the different layers of the drawings cut off though right here. Go ultimate, maybe? All right, they're really putting a lot of effort into the lighting of Vilgax's attacks, and now the lightning balls are back. I feel like a lot of the motions are a bit too slow. It's kind of like they're fighting on the moon. Look at their jumps. Like, that's really slow. Same with the way Vilgax landed over here a little bit earlier, like behind Edel. See, he should be landing, like, fast with, like, a FUD at this type of angle. You got a blind spot. UAF does this a lot, though. I'm, I'm pretty sure I've talked about this before, too, but sometimes the physics in UAF's animation is, like, very slow and floaty. That's why I like whenever they actually make the action seem strong and impactful. The ultimate sacrifice was really good at that for, like, everybody's attacks. <laughs> But then other times you'll get animation that looks like this. And it's like, eh. Like, I could probably even re-edit this to be a little bit better paced. I'm gonna give it a shot. So the landing here to here, I'm gonna speed up a little bit. I can leave a little bit of slowness in midair to, like, make this shot a little dramatic, but... I mean, we can speed up all the way to the impact. All right, this is the original. And here's the edit. One more time, original. 
Edit. So yeah, I feel like if you speed up certain parts of it, not only does it flow better, it makes the impacts feel stronger too. The audio being sped up gives away the fact that this is an edit a little bit, but you get what I'm saying. Oh my god, he drove all the way here. So they walked into the cave, walked out of the cave, got in the plane, flew all the way to Gwen's house, and now Kevin got in Natalie's car and drove here. The amount of time it actually takes to get here and back fluctuates so greatly. In fact, Gwen was running at super speed, and Kevin beat her here in Natalie's car. That's insane. Oh, now she's just walking, I guess. My so-called herald refuses to use the power I've given him. No, master! I have never- This is also oh, another weird tangent, but because there's such different heights, this really breaks up the shot and makes it harder to focus on. In order to sort of cheat that out, if it was like a lower shot that uplifted them, it would make their faces appear more in the center of the frame. Like if this was Humongousaur and this was Kevin, and you know, the webcam is the camera. Despite them being different heights, if you lowered the camera, the gap closes based on where you put the camera. So you can have their heads closer together and make a more appealing shot than this without compromising their heights. The most powerful being in your world is at my command. Oh yeah, this is where that line comes from. Let her go, creep! Scandalous. Kevin doing damage to a car? What does the world come to? Although, I'm not gonna count this in vehicle repairs. It's not really part of, like, the joke that Kevin's vehicles always get destroyed. This is kind of just a reactionary thing. Easy enough, master. <laughs> One shot spin, all right. Ooh, telekinetic abilities. I think Gwen's done this a couple of times, but not often. Normally Gwen would like make a platform underneath it and lift up the platform. We can see Ascalon still has resistance to Gwen's attacks though. The seal will break. I don't want to hurt you. You know, now that I think about it, Anodite Gwen is so much more powerful than Vilgax right now, right? Like, Vilkubra over here is struggling against Edel and George, whereas Gwen comes in and smacks them both away. And Dagon can mind control her. So how come he's not mind controlling Vilgax? Because Vilgax is playing the Dagon right now. He's just pretending to be loyal. But, like, Dagon can sure fire make Vilgax loyal. If he can mind control Gwen, he can easily mind control Vilgax. So it's it's weird that Dagon's allowing Vilgax to maintain his own independence, yet mind controls every everybody else. Man, Humongousaur has bad luck when it comes to being forcibly transformed. This is animated pretty well. Like how it closes up and wraps her hair in, almost like a flower blooming in reverse. And I love whenever Kevin uses his powers on other people too. And he can create mainstay objects. So all of his different weapons that he makes with his hands and stuff, if he makes them, can he like detach them from him and then just hold on to them and pass them around? Like, here's a mace for you. Here's some scissors. Here's a sword. Kevin could be manufacturing his own arsenal. I mean, there's no real difference between making and leaving behind a helmet than like anything else as long as it's just a metal shape, right? I can't believe you did that. I also felt like Dagon possessing Gwen lasted a little longer than this. I could have hurt you. You'd never hurt me. That's very sweet, and is also true. We've seen that when Kevin was off the rails being Ultimate Kevin, Gwen still tried to be reasonable and save his life. So it's like when Kevin says that, he's not just being sweet, he really does mean it. She would do anything she can to try to not hurt him. You too, Ben. No need. He's like super against the helmet. At first he was almost offended that Kevin tried to give him his helmet, and now this is the second time. It's gotta be his own pride or whatever. But yeah, see, he's just busting these helmets out like nothing. If this wasn't the finale, I wish we would have had more time to explore this ability. He's come a long way from just making small coatings on his skin. You will be the first to fall. His shoulders are massive in this shot. What's going on? Now this ship looks like it's made from the same type of tech that Vilgax's Alien 4 ship is made from. I feel like we have seen this specific ship before though, but I can't remember it. UAF ships don't look that distinguished from each other. Did Siphon have a ship in Reflected Glory? He was looking at them from some ship, and Vilgax's ship blew up in the ocean. So is this the ship that Siphon was using in that episode? I'm just gonna assume yes. You took your time, Siphon. Looks like a big showdown's getting ready to happen. 
you know what? This is actually kind of the shot I was talking about earlier, how Jerry, Rig, and George have such massive height differences. But if you lower the camera angle, it centers their faces a little bit more. Although this is still a pretty big difference. But this doesn't look as jarring than like, you know, the difference between Kevin and Humongousaur in that one shot. I think the, the angle really helps. Although interesting to use Jerry Rig. Probably thought he could dismantle whatever machine Vilgax just landed with. But what's this? At last. Indeed, dragon. I like that George still calls him the dragon. Tis the moment the Forever Knights have been preparing for these long millennia. No, they haven't, man. They've been off doing everything but this. You even had to come in and whip them back into shape. This is what they were supposed to be preparing for, but clearly they were all unprepared for this. <laughs> After being periodically cracked more and more throughout this season, we've finally seen it come to an end. I think this looks great, the way it all falls apart and still maintains all of its texture and detail. Where is he? There's nothing there. Man, Vilgax is so expressive in this episode. It's very weird to see him have emotions. There he is. For the first time on screen, we finally get to see what the Dagon really looks like. I'm everywhere. He is gigantic. I actually really like the Dagon's design. I love how bumpy and gross looking his tentacles are. This, this angle doesn't really work for George. Okay. So I'm going to do something a little weird this time. I've noticed that all of the ratings I have for this episode are exactly the same as the last episode, except the plot has two more points. So right off the bat, I'm just going to address it. Plot's three, characterization's two, visuals are three, importance is five, and entertaining is two, giving us a 15 out of 25. Now, I do think this episode was slightly a step up from the last one, but it still suffers from a lot of the same problems. Weird pacing, less than engaging action, and a lot of moments where it really feels like they're just trying to eat up time. Like, I really think this finale was just planned in bullet points, and they were like, we're gonna have three episodes, and we'll get to what we do. But I, there's just not enough to really fill up these three episodes, or I guess, like, they're just focusing on the wrong things here. Like, I did like that little scene where they had to go back to Gwen's house, and she was looking for a stronger spell, but then Dagon just possesses her anyways and brings her right back to the seal, so it didn't go anywhere. And I'm not saying because it didn't go anywhere, then that sucks. You know, sometimes your plans just don't work. Out, and that's valid but I just I don't know what type of story I'm trying to follow here like most big two-part episodes there's a clear structure to what's happening and here it, it just also feels like not much really happened I don't know maybe I'm not explaining this right it's like War of the Worlds Part 1, right? It was more or less just rounding up the characters and then a gigantic battle, right? But there was structure to it. Cooper developed the cure guns. They were trying to make it to the hybrid control tower so that they can stop the jump gate. And it feels like it was sprinkled with a lot of really interesting and cool moments. Stuff that makes it worth sitting through the show. Like there was a lot of character payoff. There was action payoff. We saw Ben with the master control. But here it doesn't feel like we're really getting any payoff. We're just getting more story. Like Vilgax is trying to break the Dagon out. George and Ben are trying to stop him from breaking the Dagon out, but that's pretty much all that's happening. There's no, like, really interesting and intriguing moments happening. You know, the Esoterica were pretty much forgotten halfway through the episode. Like, you know, the entire world getting transformed into Esoterica? That didn't really do anything. Gwen's Anodite form? That was kind of cool. Okay, you know what? There, there was that payoff. Gwen getting possessed in the creature from beyond did lead to something here. So, I guess that's what I'm looking for. Moments of connection. Like, I, I still feel like I'm not explaining this right. There's just this underlying sense of aimless to this finale that I just can't shake. It doesn't feel as connected to the arc that it's from as much as any of the other arcs we've had before, and everything else in the ratings suffer because of that. So I just got a batch of miscellaneous thoughts for you. Gwen getting possessed by the Dagon was really cool, and in fact, I would have traded more scenes of that for a bunch of the excess stuff that happened in the beginning of the end. Maybe her and Kevin stay behind at Gwen's house looking for a spell, and Ben alone went to the seal to fight with George, since that's pretty much what happened anyways. All of that happens in the beginning of the end. Then in this episode, Gwen is possessed and fights alone alongside Vilgax against Kevin, Ben, and George. Maybe it doesn't happen that exact way, I'm just thinking of different ways to switch things up, create some more interesting scenarios that fans can invest themselves into, rather than the trio against the mooks battle number 148 or whatever. Also, there was so much time dedicated to Edel that it would have been better towards at least one of Ben's ultimate forms. I get that they were trying to showcase the new aliens, but 51 episodes in, it still feels like they haven't properly showcased the ultimates. 
maybe we could have gotten the scene of him using at least two or three in a rapid succession. Then that drains the ultimatrix and George has to cover him while it recharges. I, I don't know. Again, I'm just spitballing ideas here. I'm not attached to any of this. But also the fact that George continues to call Dagon the dragon sort of disproves my theory that the Dagon looking like a dragon was only in legend because George was there and he still calls him a dragon. So I guess the Dagon can shapeshift after all. And lastly, I said pitch me some episodes of Ben 10 where Kevin using his car as a submarine would pay off since we never properly got that. I liked this one about an underwater plumber base that actually sets up Rook before Omniverse. I always felt like with the character Tack, the fact that the trio met him in advance and him never showing up in the future was a missed opportunity. Perhaps you could have swapped out Tack with Rook in that episode, or this episode that the true Batman 66 is pitching right here, as a soft introduction to him in Omniverse, similar to Magister Patelliday and Mr. Bowman. This episode here also involves Rook, but actually takes place during the Omniverse episode Auto Motives, where Kevin and Rook go to a car show on Four Arms' home planet. And there's even a scene where they get knocked off a cliff, and had that cliff had water at the bottom, that would have been the perfect opportunity. But my favorite one right here builds off of the fact that Vilgax's ship was at the bottom of the ocean, involving Siphon trapped down below, a kraken from the original series, and Siphon attempting to cure Vilgax from his weakened form. I think setting up Siphon a little bit earlier would also strengthen the finale as well, since his only other appearance in UA is during the Cash and JT web show episode. Anyways, there's tons of great ones in the comments of the previous video, so go check them out. This was just a handful of ones I felt highlighting. And also, with last week's poll, it seems that most people do agree that developing Omniverse did hinder Ultimate Alien's ending. The level in which it did is surely debatable, and not something I'm confident in. But I have to disagree with the folks that say developing Omniverse didn't affect Ultimate Alien at all. For this week's poll, I have something a little different. In the upcoming Omniverse breakdowns, my top four arcs of Omniverse, at least at the time of recording, is the Malware arc, the Incursion arc, the Cervantes arc, and the Time War arc. Of those four arcs that I'm personally looking forward to, which one are you most excited to see me break down? Let me know in the community tab when this video goes live. I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your weekend. And as always, keep it fizzy. All right, take one. <sighs> I'm gonna do a couple takes. <laughs> Ah! Woo! Been a while since I've done something. Ah! <laughs> ah, ah, ah! Fuck me! I'll do a better one.